Try to think two steps ahead and see what's going on as opposed to just being the tunnel vision in it. Hello and welcome. You're tuned in to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 588, with today's guest, Mr. Mike Abel. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for the show, founder of Whistlekick, passionate traditional martial artist, and... I guess that's really all you need to know. I love martial arts. I love training all styles. Doesn't matter what it is. You give me something to learn that's a punch or a kick or a block or involves one of those things and I'm I'm game. Let's do it. And that's why everything we do at Whistle Kick is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to know more about what we're doing to that end to support the traditional martial artists of the world, check out whistlekick.com. That's our online home. It's the easiest place to find our products. And if something in the store over there, which helps fund all the things that we do, interests you, use the code PODCAST15. That's going to get you 15% off. Everything for the show is on a different website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. The show comes out twice a week, and the purpose of the show is to connect, educate, and entertain the traditional martial artists of the world. And if you want to help support the work that we do, yeah, you could make a purchase, but there are also plenty of other things you could do, things that... Some of them don't even cost money. Follow us on social media. Tell people about what we're doing. Sign up for the newsletter. Join the Patreon. Patreon.com slash Whistlecake. Yeah, that one costs money. As little as two bucks a month. And if you join the Patreon, you're contributing money directly to us and you get free exclusive, well, not free because you're paying for it, but you get exclusive content coming back at you. Stuff that you're not going to see anywhere else. And the more you're willing to part with a few bucks, the more we're going to give you back. it goes up from there, but we're committed to delivering overwhelming value, and we very rarely have people stop their Patreon contribution, so that tells me we're doing something right on that front. Here we are, we're knocking on episode 600, and if you look back at the list of guests we've had, we've had a lot of people from all over the world, different styles, but most of them are high-ranking martial artists, whether they're well-known or not. They tend to be school owners or really high-standing people in their martial arts community. Well, we've had some people on the show who bring a different perspective, people who are students for one reason or another, and they've got a story to tell. Well, today's guest is one of those. Mr. Mike Abel is every bit a passionate traditional martial artist as the other guests that we've had on the show, but he doesn't have a claim to fame in the way that you might expect all of our guests to have it because we bring on people from all different backgrounds, all different styles, because that's really important to me. What he does bring to the show is an incredibly relatable story. One about starting and stopping one about training as we age. And there's some really good insight in here stuff that whether you're younger and planning on getting older, because we all are, or maybe you're new to training and you've got a few years on you and you look around at some of these younger folks and say, man, I, I, don't, I don't know that I can relate to them. Well, this is an incredibly relatable episode, and I hope that you enjoy it. Hey, Mr. Abel, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you for having me here. <laughs> hey, it's a pleasure to have you. Thanks for your willingness to do the show. And, you know, we're going we're gonna to talk about you. I mean, that's, that's the beauty of the show is that, in, in a sense, every Monday we put out the same thing. And at the same time, it's also so different because everybody's different. We've got a lot in common, but we've got stuff that's not common, which is what makes stories interesting. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's never been a good one for talking about myself. I, I, it, well, the, my job is to change that, to, to, to help you through that, that challenge. You know, it's one of the things that I love about this show, and, and, I'll, and I'll share this with you. There, there was an email that came in yesterday from a listener who we we have a patreon it's a it's a way that that our listeners can support us you know just throw a few bucks and and chip in and cover the the financial aspects of the show and whenever we get somebody new who signs up for that i always email them and say hey you know why i want to know why and he told me kind of a two-part story talking about his martial arts career And how much it had meant to him. And then, you know, this dark place that he went into, and I'll I'll spare the specifics to to be kind to him, but that listening to the stories of other martial artists on this show was a 
an important part of helping him through that. And now he's started training again. So I think that's really interesting to consider that, you know, our stories to ourselves are so, I mean, they're, they're in a sense trivial. We lived them. We were there, but you never know when your story, the, what has normalized to you can be impactful to someone else. So given all of that, I'll, I'll start with an easy question for you. We, we, this is how we usually start off. When did you start training? Uh, well, maybe my mid twenties. So, and what, I guess what was the reason for that? Uh, exercise. Uh, I used to do a lot of work uh, with horses, and what I found with a lot of the riding, uh, even just playing say softball, <clears throat> I would have a wicked Charlie horse running the first base the first time. The muscles were always mm. so. I yeah. needed something to help with the stretching, the flexibility martial arts yoga wasn't around that much at that time Mm -hmm. and uh so that was a rough three months (laughs) i would you know get home from class soak in the tub and after three months i could realize i saw how much more flexibility i had and i I decided to stick with okay and what was it (sighs) that's not the question How were you exposed to martial arts in a way that you knew flexibility was even on the table? It wasn't. I think it was more for the exercise than I realized the flexibility was so much more to it. It was with it. And, and, and you know, just to be the, the range of movement, mm. realized how much I had lost. Yeah, if you don't use it, you lose it, right? I mean, oh, yeah, everything was cliche, cliche, but it's, it's so it's, true. So true. So, so you step in for fitness, you find flexibility, but you, you, You've been going for a little while, so you found more than flexibility in there. Yeah, I, I, I really, I'm going to have to say that's really the, the big thing. Uh, especially as you get <clears throat> older, the flexibility, you know, does go. And, uh, you know, got to be careful more slips and falls and things. Yeah. I have slipped more times pulling the song, uh, the, <clears throat> the snowblower back in the wind. <laughs> and... Just automatically falling into a roll, and you know, I don't know how many times it just went both of them just completely right out from under. And so there's there's a lot of things that that, that come out. Uh, as part of my job, I have been had to testify for the state, and uh, having the breathing and mm. the uh, the focus. You know, I just taking that breath and the focus. Has helped me. Believe that. Was there a point in your training where you started to notice that stuff? <laughs> Talked about flexibility, you know, kind of in in almost in hindsight, you know, three months in. But some of those other things that a lot of us find as we train for a while, focus, uh, changes to breathing, self esteem, things like that, they can take a while, and it's it's really it's not something that we tend to, to notice in the moment. It's oh, that's been. That's been easier. And I yes, it's, it's martial arts. almost until you need it and mm. there without thinking about it. But it's been because of that training, doing it on and on. Yeah. So there was a couple of times where I had to put, you know, my martial art training and such on hold. And then, you know, stops and starts. You know, it, that's a far more common occurrence than a lot of longtime practitioners like to talk about and it's actually it's something that i think is important to talk about because there's there's this stigma about it that oh you know i i I stopped training for a while and you know depending on how i look at it i either took a big step back or even stopped training for about two years just due to some some logistics in life and when i was going through it and even not long after i was embarrassed by that because martial arts is something i've done for so long and i love but as i've aged i look at it a little bit differently now i'm wondering if you might talk about those times or one of those times and what happened why and and i think most importantly how you got back my uh my first break was i went back to college and i ended up uh, traveling out of the state and then uh we moved back after i got my master's degree Uh, and i was married at that time and uh it was a martial arts thing. That was a a different school, but it was in this 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 the same thing. At the time it was master self defense. 
And uh, so I went back and I was doing well. I, I went up to the brown belt and, uh, you know, typical kid kind of thing. I was walking by one of the heavy bags and I did a, uh, <clears throat> I kick at it and my body kept moving and my leg stayed where it was. And I did a wicked, wicked groin. And that, all right, that was months getting back. And then I had two kids. <clears throat> and so I just didn't go back. And I uh, fast forward to now my uh, mid to late 40s. And my son wanted to try. I said, sure. And so he's doing that. And I'm sitting on my hands. <clears throat> because I was like, oh, I remember that. <laughs> you know, you want to sit, I'm in the audience. I don't want to sit. Try this. No, don't do this. And and I said, I don't, I want to go back. So I let him get like four ranks up. So I didn't want it. I wanted it to be his thing. Hmm. I didn't want, you know, oh, you know, I'm going at two and then you know, I'm butting into his thing. Sure. But uh so then, then I went back and my brain still knew how things go, but the body just wasn't there again. And it was so, so frustrating. The, uh, I, my sense at the time was, you know, laughed. Says, hey, well, you, you still think you're 25, <laughs> you know, mentally. And yeah. you just got to, you know, it'll come back. It'll come back. But, you know, don't push the things. You're just going to give yourself more injury pushing. It was frustrating. Very, very frustrating. Of course. Uh, you know. And if you can't laugh at your mistakes, that's the thing I guess I've learned. Uh, I'll get frustrated and the instructors will know I'm frustrated because I start laughing. Because I'm frustrated at myself and that's my release. It's a better way to handle it than some of the alternatives. Mm. How did it go as your sign progressed and at some point you said, okay, he's he's established enough in doing this that I feel comfortable stepping in. How did, okay, sorry. How, how did that go with your relationship with your son and, and your son's relationship to training? I, I think it went well. Uh, we had someone to bounce things off of every now and then. Uh, we uh, they're doing some of the Kali sick and it was great having someone to practice with. So, you know, he was, he was my bunkai. He was my uh, person I practiced things with. Oh, nice. How old was he when he started? He started in his, like, 12. Okay. And he, there, There's a big difference between, you know, working with, with your kid if your kid's six. Yes. Versus 12 versus, you know, 18. And, you know, and we could... Also, you know, we could we joke at the things. And he's like, I get my belt. I say, Oh, I'm catching up to you. He says, Oh, is that that little dot in my rearview mirror there? <laughs> <laughs> but, healthy competition. Yes. Now he's in college and uh, he's at the brown belt, and they keep uh, asking, oh, When are you going to you know, go for your black? And he says, I want to finish the college first. And, Mm. And he's still doing it though, but it's at a reduced pace. Sure. As you know, sure. It's you get what you put into it out of it. And if for whatever yeah. reason, college, anything else that you're only going in maybe once a week or something, you're gonna be at, you know, kind of a plateau. But you realize that it's you know it's a, it's a cliche, but it really is true. It's the journey, it's not the destination. Yeah. Was your son's interest in training at all tied to what you had done in the past? Had you told him stories? Had you encouraged him? Uh, I've told him stories. I don't really never asked him why he wanted to get into it, but because uh... I can I can imagine that you know it it made an impact on you. I, I think it's pretty rare that somebody trains and and there isn't an an impact. No, not everyone goes back, but there's usually, you know, if you put in some time, there's some some fond memories. There's some acknowledgement of growth as a person. You know, you talked a little bit about that. 
so I'm to my mind thinking, you know, you must have had some strong influence on this, but maybe, maybe not, in which case it's a beautiful coincidence. On on why you started, but I mean, you know, we did things together. Yeah. Things from, you know, uh the one I started on one was a Ken Poe and a little bit of uh, the Shaolin, which was much more flowing than some of the Japanese styles. And I uh, mm-hmm. really enjoyed that. I enjoyed there were just some techniques that would just flow, or some some katas flow better than others. And uh, those are the ones I really like. And especially, you know, as I'm getting on, <laughs> certain movements have more of a flow to it. And those are the ones that uh, you can keep up with better than the. the Say punching drills. Uh, punching drills will, after a while, give me you know, wear and tear on the shoulders, or, or I can feel it in the shoulders and things stiffen up. But mm. there are other techniques that are more of a, almost like doing a figure eight, if you will, the way that flow comes in. It's yeah. not the <clears throat> end and back and end and back. And those actually, you know, it, it is, you know, I'll, I'll, as I get older, are much better for my body than the others. So I'm not so much with the sparring anymore, but uh, I will do it. I do do it. <clears throat> but uh, it's come back into the, the forms. I really enjoy uh, Statue of the Crane, which is a form. And it's a, to me, it's a balanced form. And it flows well. And, you can do it slow, almost into a Tai Chi style. Yeah. And I think that helps my body at this, this age. Sure, sure. And I, I love forms for similar reasons. When you're doing that form, what's going through your mind? Is it, well, I, 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 won't, even, I won't even prime the answers. I'll just ask. It's, it's <laughs> kind of funny because, you know, as you know, the more you think about a form, kind of the stiffer it gets. So it's, I guess, concentrating on my breathing and moving and doing the breathing with the movements. If you're concentrating on that, mm. it, it seems to flow so much better. But when you start trying to think of what the next move is or what and this and is my step here and that, then you start you know, messing with yourself. Just letting things, you know, letting things flow, or, or getting to the point where you know it well enough that it flows. That's that, that, that's a, a good thing because you, know, you can think of when you started on some forms and be like, ah, ah, ah. ah. <laughs> I think we've all experienced that for sure. Yeah. And as you now, realize that I did this in a flow with the breathing and just almost, I don't want to use the word unconscious, but more maybe self-focused on it that you realize that now you're getting it. You said something to the effect that sparring isn't, I, I took it to mean wasn't as of much interest to you as maybe no, no, it had it's, been. It's not as, a, that doesn't interest me that much anymore. Sure. But it's, it is needed. It helps you with your sure. timing oh, and, of course. and all the other things. But, uh... but that suggests that it had been of more interest. And I'm going to <laughs> guess that maybe this was more when when you were yeah. younger and yeah. you know maybe in your first let's call it uh, instance with training when you when you reflect on that you and the current you you know it's there there's a bit of a time gap there oh. and a physical gap you know your body's mm-hmm. different now than it was then your mind is certainly different now than it was then you know were there things that that you regretted not doing at that point, or things that you would have done differently at that point? Well, I'm gonna say hindsight is twenty twenty, and you know the younger me, I'd have to say, got tunnel vision, got into the thing, and got into the maybe the ego. Uh, oh, you tagged me! Oh, I gotta make sure I get the next tag kind of thing instead of just being able to 
almost step back from yourself. Are you doing it? All right, yeah, you did tag me, but what did I do wrong? Why did you? Why were you able to tag me? And it's and and to try to think two steps ahead and see what's going on, as opposed to just being that tunnel vision in it. Yeah. I'm saying it right, but it's you know it's that kind of a mindset. Yeah, I, I get it. That makes that makes complete sense. Martial arts is is as far as I'm concerned, it's cool in that. <laughs> You know, there there are always ways to progress, even as we get older and our body maybe doesn't do certain things that it used to do, or maybe you start later in life and you're lined up next to someone who's 18 and is seemingly incapable of, of injury. Yes. <laughs> and but, recovery time you know, is longer. <laughs> what's that? The recovery time is longer. Yeah. yeah. We, we, as we get older, you know, recovery time, but we also have life context and a better understanding of what works for our bodies. And yes. I find, I think the the one that I'd love for you to talk about that I, I think is most important. And, and the more time that I spend on the show, the more time that I'm involved in martial arts, because I'm getting older, I haven't figured out a way to go the other way, but it's, it's the reason it's the why it's the motivation. And that as we age, we tend to have clear understanding of why we do things because let's face it, you don't have to train. You don't have to do it. I don't have to do it. I'm going to guess hardly anybody listening has to do it. Maybe maybe some young kids are forced, quote unquote, forced to attend yeah. classes. Yeah. But I, I don't do very many things in life at all that I don't want to do. What Training is something I, I want to do. So here you are now, at whatever age you are, doesn't matter, but clearly older than you were. and. I'll say it's 61. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Because there, there's somebody out there who's 61 or maybe maybe 58, and they're they're nodding along saying, okay, yeah. Because we get people who listen to this show early on in their martial arts career and they find some some motivation. Because let's face it, most martial arts classes don't have a lot of folks in their 60s. <laughs> and so to, to know that you're not alone is is valuable <laughs> so here you are now 61 why do you keep going back there's so many things to learn even if it's a nuance and if you twist your hip a little bit more here on your on your uh, roundhouse or or a different form or even uh some of the different weapons things. It's something different all the time. And it exercises, to me, it exercises the mind as much as the body, the focus, the, uh, the different neurons that have to trigger down to get into a, uh, uh, to get the motion. And Chuck's frustrate the heck out <laughs> right now because when I start trying to use the left hand, you know, it's like I have no absolutely no control over my body. But it, then again, it's also kind of fun because I'm learning to use the left as much as the right. One of the things that I love about training is that there is, not only is there no shortage of things to learn, but there is a seemingly increasing amount of stuff to learn. Yes, that every time I feel like I get something down, it opens up three more doors to other things to work on. And you have to be okay with not knowing everything and not being good at everything. Uh, my sense I would always say is uh, you have to empty the cup. Sure. Your cup when, when you come into a class or any class. Because if your cup is full and you think you know it all, then how much can you put in there? Exactly. Or as I just say, leave your ego at the door. <laughs> mm. Was that a lesson that you had to learn when you were younger? Absolutely. And and going back, I'd have to say, okay. I said, you know, I, I thought it was still 25. Mm. I had to learn that, you know, the, the body has to get those connections and get that muscle memory back. It doesn't matter how much I knew then and what I was before. 
this is the way I am today. And, you know, you just got to, uh, you know, you deal with it. Mm. Was it was it hard not to get down on yourself when you know you you, you remember being at a certain level mm. as a certain capacity with your training and things just aren't working the way they used to you know you you know the body the muscle memory hasn't come back yet was was that a struggle emotionally did you say you know maybe maybe I'm going to back out not push forward on this not to the point of backing out but conversation with myself on the drive home hmm. what did those conversations sound like yeah you know what you know you think it no you like that and you should have known that you should have known that but but also what was fun is when uh or I'd be like, today's lesson is this technique. And sometimes one of the old ones that I had one would snap out. In a sense, that was kind of cool, but I wasn't learning the lesson I was supposed to be learning. <clears throat> and to make myself step back and do those things. But uh, also, it was kind of nice when they took the rust off sometimes. Some I would ask a question, but uh... as you've you've pushed through, there was I would imagine in maybe not everything, but in many things, a point where you exceeded where you had been. You know, I get the sense that your your degree of knowledge, your you know the things you've learned and and have understanding of, is much greater than it had been. What what was that transition point like? Because it, it sounds like just from, from the conversation that we're having, you've been very aware of the, the physical differences in your training through these different life stages. So that the contrast of that versus the additional knowledge, you know, were, were you, were you cognizant of that as you said, you know what, I, I do know a lot more now than I had back then. Do you remember that day, week, year? No, I, I can't think of any particular point when I did it, but uh, uh, the sensei that I'm, I have now is a sensei in another uh, style. And he wanted to, uh, we became good friends. And uh, he wanted to spread his own wings and, and start his own studio. So I went with him. And I have some of the other senseis at the other past school, <clears throat> I said that they'd also learned some things from me. And I was like, I'm going, huh? <laughs> but it's just the way I talked to the other students or I talked to them and asked questions, what I thought this and that, the other things. You know, they, they felt they learned a little bit from me. So maybe in that conversation, kind of, you know, which you know, feels good. Sure. Oh, absolutely. And And, and I think there's, there's something to be said for different perspectives, even on the same lessons, the same techniques, material, however you want to look at it. Because we all learn differently. So to hear the same thing I, I've had, and we have people listening who've had me come into their school and I've taught and they've become in a sense frustrated because I've said the same thing sometimes in the same words and it, it, it gets through. Oh, but I've been I've been telling you to do it that way for three years, and Jeremy comes in and tells you to do it, and now you do well. Sometimes there's just a little bit different way, and it sounds like that's what you're talking about. This supplemental uh, context that can be really valuable. Yeah, uh, I saw a, a video with uh, Doug Makaida. And he was talking about, he says, you know, some of the training and what you're doing that stuff is a series of questions. Like when you're doing a punch technique or something, the question is, what would you do if I came this way? And then, okay, so that's your answer to that question. Now, knowing that question, and now I'm in this position, how would you 
if I, from here, I did this. And again, you're doing it slow because if you do things hard to each other, then all it learns is that all you learn is it hurts. <clears throat> you don't learn the lesson. And, and I like the thought of it as just being a series of questions. Very uh, uh, Socratic method of you. I had, t- I had teachers like that in college who they, they never <laughs> told, they never actually said anything. They just mm-hmm. kept asking questions until, right. in theory, we learned something. <laughs> you know, I had you know, one of the uh, other students that says, what would you do? If I, this is no, I think what you're asking is, what would you do if I did that? So, what would you do? Because you know, you know, they're really basically asking you, what is a, you know, what's a defense to this technique, if you will, this kind of a punch or, or this kind of a thing? Because he wants to know that. And he says, well, knowing what you know, what would your instinct be? And then, you know, they kind of help them puzzle it out for themselves. Yeah, there's value in that in having to stumble through for the lesson. It, hmm. I think it sticks around more. They are, yeah. The forms or the particular techniques that have you know, been, you know, the nunchucks. You know, with the left hand is the most frustrating, but you know, it's probably the most valuable. That means that's what I need to work on. Work on the left arm. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, th- there's there's something to be said for that new skill acquisition as we age. There are a lot of studies out there that that talk about learning new languages as we get older and, and it uh, being really good for maintaining brain health. But I would imagine that physical skills as well, especially something in the quote unquote off hand, the other side would be just as maybe even more effective. And it, it's fun to me. You're doing those things and you know, the realization I also would carve. Mm. And I have a caricature that I did in the very first caricature class that I had taken. And it's very blocky, but I keep it in my cabinet because, you know, it's kind of like the white belt. That shows me where I was. And I can look at the other things where I am. So if if you don't mind, I'd, I'd love to get into some specifics about you and your training and and what it looks like and I, i'm i'm gonna play the age card i guess okay because and, and here here's why here's why the majority of folks that we have on the show are instructors school owners people who have been training a long time and have kind of their own way of doing things that let's face it, quite a bit of it is is closed off. It's behind the scenes. But we do get people who start martial arts at all ages. And as I, as I said earlier, it's valuable for them to see a path forward and know that, okay, my body's not doing this, but I want it to be able to do this. And oh, okay, here's Mike. He's able to do this. That That helps me see where I might be able to go. So would you would you mind sharing some of those things that you you do to get the most out of your training? Uh, some sort of warm up is always best. Get the muscles warm before you, before you do that. And whether it's just doing uh, sit ups or uh, some leg lifts or something like that, just to get those muscle groups warm, and then I do a little stretching after that. And uh, if I can, I'll do a form or two. And uh, some of the forms will do almost like a Tai Chi kind of a style. <clears throat> do the breathing and get a stretch in on some of those the long stances and things. And I think that helps warm my muscles and get a little bit of a stretch in before I do the training. Sure. Is there anything that you do... Let's say differently during class than than others might do. My um, differently or <clears throat> my left side because of the hip uh, is a little lower than the, than the right, so I know I'm not to push mm-hmm. on that until I get three quarters through class, and then it starts to catch up with my right. 
it's it's recognizing those things on your body and adjusting to it, I guess is. And then I think the most important stage for most of us is after. You you mentioned recovery earlier, which suggests to me that you've got some some things that you do after class to set you set yourself up for the next class. What are those things? Stretching before and you know, after, I think, is probably, in in, in my estimation, are uh, better. Are are you get more of a stretch because everything's warmed up and it's been worked out, which also helps you set up for the next day to get some of that stretching done after. Yeah, I'm a I'm a big fan of stretching after. Because if you stretch yes. a lot before, those muscles are really loose, and then you're asking them to do things. And if you're throwing power through it, yeah, if you're 15 or 20, that's probably not going to have an impact. But the older we get, those muscles need to be able to stabilize. That's yeah. That's why I like to do a warm up before I yeah do that. And then I, I like stretching after for for the fact that. Um, that kind of movement can be helpful in, in moving the lymphatic system around and flushing stuff. Yes. You know, waste, waste product. So you don't go home and just sit and plop. Oh, no, no, no. I, I'll, I'll stiffen up. A bit. Just, yeah, exactly. <laughs> said it. Exactly. When I was 20, I could hop right in the car, go home, you know, sit on the couch and not have to worry about it. But, you know, at, at 40, if I do that, then the next day, you know, I'm, oh, I don't, I don't really like how my body feels right now. You know, the oh yeah, there, before the during and the after. There are some matter. days where you know <laughs> you're going down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. For sure. And and one aspect that you didn't bring up, but I, I'm going to be shocked if if this isn't something that's conscious for you. In a you know, a typical class for most of us is an hour, hour and a half at some places. We're probably not going a hundred percent for that whole hour. You're probably picking, okay, this is a place where I'm going to dial it back a little bit. This is a place where I'm going to push a little bit harder. What What is that thought process like? Being able to listen to my body in the beginning. Uh, couple of weeks ago in that that snow we had i was going up a hill i uh work outdoors and the left leg slid back when i was going uphill and i did a lunge and it was cold and so i had a wicked groin bolt mm. where i know where my body is tightest is well i will dial back until i can get that warmed up to do something and you know and i'll i'll, I'll tell the instructor you know, I have this, and so I'm just going to dial it back on that leg until things warm up, and then so at the point we'll, you know, work together long enough, and he knows that it's, you know, and I'll do that. He knows my biggest thing is sometimes I won't dial. <laughs> sure, sure. It's now I'm thinking I'm fifty. <laughs> yeah. It's you know, and and sometimes I get pushback on that concept and oftentimes you know it's from younger instructors who they don't quite you know maybe they haven't had to go through any chronic injury or something like that but i'd rather see someone show up and do 80 percent than a hundred percent and then they can't come to class for two weeks right uh when i did that tear in my leg it wasn't uh, that really bad groin pull uh, the, the doctor had said, and this is you know, back then, he says, you remember, he said, Roger Clemens was out for an entire season because of a groin bolt. And again, his muscle and my muscle, there's no comparison between the two, but you do a, you know, a bad pull, you do a bad pull, and it's going to put you out for a while. No matter, you know, how young you are, when you do that to your muscle, you... you yeah, maybe that's when you learn. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we tend to learn from experience. The older we get, the more experience we have, the more we've learned in theory. Hopefully we don't repeat those mistakes. Just at a slower rate. <laughs> right. Right. 
you've mentioned instructors, you mentioned your son. I feel pretty strongly that it's certain people that help us guide or help guide us. There we go. Words along our journey. And had they not been there, things would have been dramatically different. Maybe, you know, we don't make it past the first few classes or we don't go back or whatever it is. Are there people that you want to acknowledge that have been you know, really important to you in your martial arts journey? Well, my current sensei, uh, Herman Ocasario, <laughs> I'm going to badly mispronounce his name. Uh, he was uh, at the original, the other studio that I was at. And uh, at that time, there wasn't much of a, an adult class. And uh, just because of uh, interest or whatever. And uh, he really worked with me and just having me, helping me dial back right now. Mm. And so, and he would, you know, work on that. His father does uh, martial arts also, and he would talk to him about, you know, uh, dialing back and just, you know, the older body and things and help me with that. And so I'm just not overtraining. He just says, you know, you know, you have the form, you have that, you just, you know, not the speed of a 20-year-old, but now you just got to work on your time, you know, which is kind of a hard concept, but because uh, if you know some chick is coming or just the way that they're coming and it's they're faster, you just got to know ahead of time what they're going to do and, and mm. working smarter on, and, 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 and the timing. Things. Absolutely. And, uh, you, know, you know, with the certain joints and things like that. And, and so we've worked on the, uh, the forms and such. And uh, I really enjoyed that. He's, he's helped a lot. Here's a question that, that wasn't on the list that we sent you, but it's one that I like to ask often. And it, kind of connects a few things that we've been discussing. If you could go back to your early days of training, you know, take everything that you've learned up until now, all your understanding of, of who you are and everything, all of it, go back and, you know, have a few minutes of conversation with younger you. What advice regarding martial arts might you give yourself? I, it just it's just it goes back to that 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 cliche that you know enjoy it because you know there's gotta be a reason that you're doing it. And enjoy the things that you're enjoying of it and remember that it's just a journey and, and don't look at say the black belt and just oh, I gotta get to that black belt, I gotta get that black belt, I gotta get that black belt. It's you know, everything is a stage, it's preparing you for that. And it's it's the journey, the learning that you're doing. And I had my first strike <clears throat> in this particular school. That's what they call the first uh, first degree. Mm-hmm. Others, that's your second degree. And it's whether I ever test again doesn't matter to me. Uh, the last couple of tests, I, I have over put. I have pushed myself too much, and I've had some <laughs> recovery time on that. No. That's what testing's for, though, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Well, I uh, overtrained. I was doing 30, 40 push ups a day, you know, preparing for that thing. And uh, my shoulders really tight. And then when we were doing the jujitsu part of it, I had really pulled the muscles of my shoulder. And uh, I had some micro tears. And uh, when the fibers were growing back, they attached to the nerve. And so that's that pinched nerve that, that you get because it's not sliding like it should between the muscle groups. Mm-hmm. And my daughter <clears throat> is doing a residency now. So I had my own doctor. At that. <laughs> <laughs> and she's doing the manipulation. She says, okay, it's the nerves in, in the back that are doing that. So I had to get a referral. And so I'm in, that was my first belt. So I'm about 59, 58. And I called the doctor's office, yeah, and, you know, 
I'll get this, my left arm will go numb. <laughs> and I go down like this, and I'll get this, the pain down my left arm <laughs> to these fingers. And, you know, and I'm going, oh, no. You know, I'm telling them these things, and I know what's going through their mind. He says, how soon can you come in? <laughs> so I got there, and he's going through, and, and, and rightly so. Squeeze my hands. He's looking up my eyes and making sure he's doing basically the, uh, the fast test for uh, strokes and things like yeah. that. Making sure to rule that out. And I was just telling the eye, he says, I know, but we got to do this. He says, okay, I know. <laughs> I know. And it's like, as soon as those words were coming out of my mouth. But uh, that was a long recovery. In fact, I had the massage breaking up the microfibers that had attached. I was going to tell him what Jerry Hoffa was. <laughs> but yeah, you, know, you can overdo it easily. I mean, oh, for sure. I have to learn to pace myself. I'm still learning to pace myself. <laughs> it's a tough lesson to learn, especially when you're doing something that you enjoy. Let's let's flip the timetable here. Let's look forward. What's keeping you going? If it's not rank, if it's not so much other people, what's what's got you willing to to endure some of these kind of difficult, challenging, painful things? The challenge, I guess, is is the thing, and it's not like the physical challenge. It's it's the nuances. It's it's getting that little bit. There's always something else to learn, and it's, it exercises the mind as much as the body, and so. Yeah, I keep going back on the journey. I'm enjoying the journey. Uh, there's always something to learn. And, you know, maybe, you know, five years, six years down, I'll be doing more Tai Chi than anything else, just to keep the flow of the body moving and the rhythm and the stretches and so much as the, you know, the, the, the sparring part aspect, some of the things like that. Because there's always something that you can do. You don't always have to be doing just the uh, physical. Uh, I don't want to say the physical because it is physical. The intense? Yeah. Yeah, the intensity. <laughs> but even those, it's, it's when you just pick up a little nuance and a balance and how to do something just slightly different get that back aligned or get the body aligned just so and you can feel how much smoother the form of the technique is mm. and sometimes it's just a tiny little thing yeah i can i can identify with that for sure for sure the the, the longer you spend training the the wins the things that make you go ah finally those don't come as frequently no oh. You got to be motivated by other stuff. And it sounds like you're you're clear on what motivates you in this. That's awesome. I guess I would have stopped if I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope so. Life's too short to spend it doing things you don't want to do. All right. All right. Well, you've you've given people a lot of good stuff to think about, and. You know, you, you've you've shared a few of your, I, don't know, I guess, lessons or mantras, philosophies, however you want to you want to term it. But this is the point where we'll roll out to the conclusion, the outro that I'm going to record later. And I always like the guests to to kind of send us out to that. So what what would your final words to the people listening be? You know that we have people, you know, all over the world, different styles, different ages, different whys for their training. You know, what might you say to all of them? I guess you do on a level know why you're still doing it or why you want to do it. It's just recognizing that and finding those pieces and enjoying them. If you want it, it's an age isn't an obstacle. It's yes, you're going to do things slow. Yes, it'll take longer for the body to stretch out and do if you're starting those things. 
But what else have you got to do? I don't want to put it that way, but, you know, uh, I guess the best thing was, you know, you don't grow old because you stopped playing. Not on size, but I was like, you don't stop playing because you got old. You got old because you stopped playing. You know, it's... You just sit down and just not do anything. I don't want to do this or whatever. You, something you've got to do. Something you enjoy or would like to enjoy. You try. And that, that's, that's what keeps you going. If you didn't already know, I am completely committed to finding ways to support martial artists all over the world, no matter who they are, what they do, their why, etc. And so bringing guests on with different experiences is really important to all of us here at Whistlekick. That's what we brought you with today's story. Not what you might have expected when you tuned in, but if you've made it this far, I'm sure you got some value. So, Mr. Abel, thanks for coming on. Thanks for being so honest and open about you, your training, your story. I enjoyed it. I had a great time talking to you, and I am sure that on the other side of pandemic stuff, we will connect and have some chances to train together. Really value your time. If you want more, like transcripts or show notes, videos, links images, etc. Check out whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Every episode gets a page all to itself. And if you're down to support us and the work that we do, you've got some options. You can make a purchase at whistlekick.com with the code podcast15. You could also leave a review, buy a book on Amazon, or help out with the Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash whistlekick. If you see somebody wearing something with a whistlekick on it, make sure you say hello. And if you have feedback like guests, topics, or anything else, email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. That's all for today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.